I need a little bit. I need a couple more in the choir. Yes, sir. Come on. I got these good-looking young'uns on the back row, so we need some on the front row. Good morning, Sunshine. Good morning. Good. Welcome, Sunshine Church. Beautiful morning, isn't it? Sure is. Great to be alive in the house of the Lord today. We have any announcements we need to share. No, it is nice to be able to fan instead of freezing, isn't it? <laughs> I know something about some potato soup. That's coming up real soon. Right, Luann? Yep, it's all, there's a paper in your bulletin you can fill out. People out there on the, online, uh, let us know some way or another if you're interested in some potato soup. So, anything else we need to share? Found a case knife out in the parking lot. So if nobody claims that this is a good one, I'll probably keep it. So. <laughs> Dag gone it. <laughs> You're in church, Kendall. All right, here's the hope. All right. Anything else we need to share? Let's all stand and with our worship songs and we'll uh, welcome the presence of the Lord in with our acolytes. Well, there are several songs we normally sing during the Easter uh, time, and these are two of the ones that we normally had. Uh, we didn't have enough room for all of them last week, so we're going ahead and adding a couple more back again this because today he still lives.
praise time. Since I'm standing up here, I'm going to go first. God is good. All the time. That's right. <laughs> I want to, you know, uh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all your all, all your prayers and visits and phone calls. Because, uh, you know, I had that little heart cap the other day, and that come out real good. So I'm real thankful. No blockages or whatever, like I was scared of. And the doctor told me I could eat all the bacon, have all the biscuits and gravy, and all the fried taters. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> no, but I ain't going to tell you what he did tell me. But you know, things of life happen. In various stages of your life, uh, you know, you, you stop and think on it. As, uh, Years go by and you look back at it. Oh, I was a little ornery here and there, like, like one or two of us. But, uh, but you want to think, you know, are you right with God when you get in those situations? So it makes you study. It makes you look back. And it makes you do say, hey, Lord, <laughs> please forgive me. Make sure that I'm caught up the way I should be. And uh, so I'm so thankful that I had him to look to, forward to, had him to, to bless me. So thankful for my sister. She's just like my mother. Oh, so bossy. <laughs> and I got a son that's not far behind her, so he was there with me. So they left me a lot of orders when they left town. So, But however, I'm so thankful. Thankful for you all, thankful for this church and, you know, I was telling Landy back there earlier this morning, we were talking, and I said, I've been coming to this church even before I was born. Mom and Dad had a little house right straight across the street, but I think it was a little white church then, I know it was, and uh, I can remember throwing a bottle out that window right there along that area. <laughs> Mom said, that's it, you're not getting another one after that. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm so thankful to be raised here have a lot of you out there in my life and a lot that's went on that you'll see their names on the walls around here for us under these frames that you see that's been a big influence to many of our lives. So I'll hush up. Who else got something to share this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Bob, I'm going to stand up and say all this. Uh, <laughs> uh, 41 years ago, uh, at Greene County High School, I was sitting there in the gymnasium, and this pretty girl comes up and talks to <laughs> Surely not like me. <laughs> I thought, well, I'm going to try. And I asked her. That was our first day 41 years ago. And now we've got grandkids. And, uh, you do look back on your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, this church has been a big part of that. Especially after we had kids. You know, I mean, we, we struggled just like everybody else. Through. 
<laughs> I'm glad you straightened him up, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> oh there <laughs> quiet over here somebody on this side this morning <laughs> we're so thankful to have you too sure are <laughs> I lost twenty four dollars by All right, good job. We have any prayer requests this morning. Good. Else have any prayer requests this morning? Oh, I heard the uh, Teresa guy a new set of tires for his Mustang. <laughs> and, uh, Rick said uh, that'll just make it easier to push. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they're praying for the pushers there, preacher. <laughs> Let's 
She'll do good. Look at her. <laughs> yep, she'll do great. Remember Dorothy? She's over in the hospital, so let's remember Dorothy over there. George's Bev. Continue to remember Bev, I'm sure. Anyone else this morning? My brother-in-law. Your brother-in-law, Gary. Son. All right. A lot of prayer requests. We have an unspoken request. Ah, yes. Let's all stand. Beautiful prayer song. Gentle Shepherd. Feel free. The altar's open. The altar's open if y'all want to come forward. Got a lot of room up here. Last week we uh, sat up here in the front and, and watched uh, this place fill up to the almost every seat was taken, so it was a great thing to see. And have a little smaller crowd this week, but still we're here to worship the Lord. So let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful weather, this beautiful weekend. Lord, we uh, just praise your name every time we look out and see the sunshine, feel the heat. Uh, it just reassures us that uh, summer's coming and some of this cold weather and winter is over and uh, we can spend some, t some time outside. Uh, Lord, we just uh, ask a special blessing upon this church. We ask that you bless the Methodist Church and the Methodist Church organization and the decisions they'll be making in the future about how they will worship you. And we hope that uh, when they make those decisions, they're looking at you when they make them. Lord, uh, we just think, are so thankful for all the uh, things that have happened in this church in the last uh, few weeks. Um, the recovery group is uh, really going strong, and a lot of people are coming to Christ. And, uh, you know, Bob 
had good results on these tests. And uh, so we, we know you're watching out for us. And we thank you so much for that. There was a lot of prayer requests um, brought forward today. You know, I didn't get them all, but a few of them, um, I'll mention you know them all already. John Hunt with the Harley accident, we just uh, asked for his uh, recovery and, uh, and glad that he's okay. Uh, Janice is gonna have some tests. Gail Howerton's uh, having issues with her eyes. Um, Grace is, is about to take some state tests and I know how test anxiety can be. Just be with her, calm her nerves and help her do the best she can. We just uh, ask prayer for the Smith family, Dorothy, Bev, George, the whole group. Lord, uh, Mike Nolte, uh, Abby, Betty's brother-in-law, uh, and then uh, Kirsten, and uh, the proms that are coming up, and graduations, and those things, Lord. We know that you know of every prayer request on anybody's mind without us even mentioning it. Those hands that went up for unspoken requests, you knew those before we raised our hands. And Lord, you're always there in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, please uh, just watch over us and protect us as we say the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. We are blessed to have a special song. I, I listened to that on twins, not to leave you out. But, <laughs> so you, you all may come up with a different name that will incorporate everybody. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this morning.
Was it worth the trip, Nancy? I thought so. <laughs> I thought so. I heard that. I heard that. My son plays in the, or plays in the praise music uh, team back at our church where we, uh, where they grew up anyway. I don't know if I grew up any, but they, they grew up there. I'm so glad to be here this morning on this uh, first Sunday after Easter. Um, the first Sunday after Easter, if we're not careful, it's like we build up all this momentum to Easter and then it just kind of goes, that's like the roller coaster peak and then it's just all downhill from there. That's not what it was supposed to be. And yet the first Easter was a lot like that. Uh, as we take a look at the scripture we're going to look at today, um, I want to emphasize uh, what's happening through three of the first witnesses to the resurrection. That was uh, Mary Magdalene and Peter and John. At least that's the way it is in John's gospel. That's the way John wants to tell it. It's his story. He can pick and leave out the things that he wants to leave out. Uh, but the things that he wanted to talk about are very important as we take a look at this thing. So uh, the title of the sermon is Look. Uh, no, look again. Uh, oh, then you better look again. <laughs> you go, that's crazy, Ken. Well, I'm a little tired today. I'm more distracted than usual with this grandbaby coming. And I know you're going, you're distracted today, Ken. Yeah, I'm a little more distracted than usual. So please you know, cut me a little bit of grace. And let's look again at the story. Let's live in the story as deep as we can for today together as we uh, look into it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that feeds us, that sustains us, that encourages us, inspires us. Lord, your word uh, empowers us. Your word guides us. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. Your word is a light to our path. Without your word, Lord, where would we be in this day and time? Uh, when all else changes, Lord, when all else is so weird, we can always count on you. Thank you for what you tell us in your word through your Holy Spirit. As two or more are gathered and you are there in their midst, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, last week we talked about uh, how Jesus, in the book of Revelation, took a kind of an odd look at Easter. Uh, the book of Revelation, Jesus says, behold, in other words, look, pay attention to, focus on, I am making all things new. You remember that? I am making all things new. It's not a one and done kind of deal. It's an ongoing process that just keeps going on and on and on because Jesus has never left the job. Jesus has never left the throne. I'm going to get some amens in here somewhere. <laughs> I may be distracted, but you're not allowed to be. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you very much. I'll keep calling for those until you all get it right. <laughs> this is an old, old story about going to the tomb first thing in the morning on the third day. Um, that Sunday morning, I doubt anybody had had much sleep the night before, I know they had not had any kind of peace of mind or heart um, much since Thursday night when their world fell apart, when Jesus was arrested. Uh, John has seen all of it, where all the other disciples kind of ran away. John, uh, because of his family connections, you remember, he was even at the trial. He heard all the things that they said to Jesus. He watched as they... Uh, humiliated him and, and they called him all kinds of names and they tried to ruin his reputation and they uh, blasphemed about him and about his father and Jesus took it. You remember he just took it all. Nobody else saw Jesus get slapped by the high priest's servant. John saw it. John tells us all these things. So John's account is an interesting account and, and we're going to go there this morning. Would you stand for the reading of the gospel? from the book of John, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Remember who Mary Magdalene is? 
Why does she follow Jesus? Anybody remember? Seven spirits were cast out of Mary Magdalene. You remember that? She is who she is. She's free today because of what Jesus did for her. She is absolutely devoted to him. She's not been allowed to go anywhere because it was the Sabbath. Uh, she was not allowed to do any work. They were stuck all in one room. It's early morning. As soon as she can get there, she's going. And we know she had some other women with her, too, in some other accounts. But she, this is her story through John. I would also remind you that Mary was probably at the foot of the cross. She saw everything Jesus went through. She is heartbroken. And now she's going to do what she can do before she can't do anything else. You hear that heart? You hear that devotion to Christ? So she comes, and what she sees is that the stone has been removed from the entrance. I want you to hang on to that piece of information. When she saw that the stone was running away, she came running back to Simon Peter and the other disciple. John doesn't like to refer to himself as me in his uh, gospel. He'll talk about the disciple that Jesus loved or the other disciple. He's talking about himself. And he said, and she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples just started for the, the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Uh, John was younger. He's going to outrun us old guys. He gets there first, okay? John bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Notice what people are looking at here. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw, and what? He believed. And then John adds this curious little parenthetical statement. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus, what? Not might, might, not had to. This is the plan. Had to rise from the dead. This is not a last-minute call on God's part. Oh, gosh, what do I do now? This had always been planned. Why did they not understand that? Because they didn't know the Scriptures yet. And then there's another weird thing. Is this what you'd do? Disciples went back to where they were staying. What's changed? Everything. And for them, nothing. Is that fair to say? Yes, Jesus is alive but then they go back into hiding. They go back to where they were. This is not something they're ready to talk about, deal with, anything else. They just go back to where they were. That's a dangerous word for us today, isn't it? To hear the word of God and then just go back to where we were. Now Mary, I like the way John goes, now, uh, unlike, <laughs> there's an unlike implied there, unlike them, Jesus I'm sorry, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to what? Look into the tomb and saw what? Two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Sounds like a dumb question, doesn't it? I think women hate when we ask those questions. Is that fair? If you loved me, you'd know. <laughs> or, 
if you knew what was going on, you'd be crying too. That's right. Why are you crying? And the question brings out her perspective. She sees everything they saw, but they've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. She's still grieving. She still wants to know where Jesus is. She still wants to know where, how to get to him. She still wants to get close to him. Even if he's dead, she still believes he's dead. They saw those things, and but we'll talk about that in a minute. She does not yet know. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was him. And he asked her, well, then why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Does Jesus ask dumb questions? No, he asks questions that guide you for yourself, that you figure things out. He could tell you the answers, but quite often he asks you a question that makes you want to know the answer for yourself. Thinking he was the gardener, she still doesn't get it. She said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. Can you imagine this little 100-pound girl going to carry Jesus? That she would do it. That's how devoted she is. I'll go get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Do you remember when your mom called your name? It was unlike anybody else who called your name or your daddy or your grandmother or your grandfather or the first time your kids said mama or daddy or something like that. You remember that? It's not like anybody else. Jesus says Mary. He called her by name. Jesus said, I know my sheep and I called them by name. You remember that? And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni. I had to look that up to make sure I pronounced that correctly which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers in their retreat, in their safe place, back in the middle of their fear, and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God, and your God. What an encouraging word. He doesn't say, I guess you guys blew it. This is a restorative word. So Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have what? Seen the Lord. And she told them that the things that he had said to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. What was it that they saw? Well, Mary sees the stone. And not to draw anything out, but those stones are not something that you just roll away. If you go to the tomb in Jerusalem, I'm told, I haven't been there, that it's a very large stone and that it rolls down into a, a seated place and it would take many, many, many men to roll that stone back. It doesn't say it was rolled back. It, it says, in, in essence, if you read the original, it was thrown down. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I kind of get the picture of what would happen if there was an explosion inside the tomb and that rock was blown out of place. What they don't say is, where are the soldiers? You remember that there was a very deep concern on the Pharisees' part that uh, the tomb be guarded. Because they said, well, what happened if the disciples, they, this guy said he was going to rise from the dead, the disciples go steal the body, and then they just start spreading this false thing about him being, so let's guard the tomb. And they took uh, a Roman uh, squad, and they would be on 24-hour duty. Two would stand at either side of the tomb, and the rest would be in a semicircle around the front. 
and every uh, two hours or two hours, four hours, something like that, two would switch to be right next to the tomb. So that everybody stayed awake and everybody stayed focused on guarding this tomb. And by the way, there was a seal that was put on there. It was a, a rope that was stretched across that rock and on either side was a big wax seal that was set, the rope was set into the, the wax and then the Roman uh, seal was put in there and for the impression, this is the official, he is dead. She doesn't say anything about that. That's gone as well. She sees the stone. She doesn't know what to make of it. How in the world would it be? And so her, her idea is the soldiers have taken the body. Something happened and they've taken the body. When she says they have taken him, that's who she's thinking about because they should have been there, right? But they weren't there. Why weren't they there? They weren't there, as we learn in, in some of the other Gospels, we weren't there because they could not explain how Jesus left. And by the way, if they failed to guard this temple, they were the ones, I mean this tomb, they were supposed to be the next ones in a tomb. You get it? And so one of the Gospels, I believe it's Matthew, says that the high priest paid them a lot of money to lie about it and say that the disciples came and stole the body. And this saved their lives and it made them a lot of money all at one time. They've taken the body. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, Mary says. I just want to know where he is so that I can do what's in my heart for him. The last thing that I can do, which is prepare his body for his funeral. We well, you know his body had been prepared a little bit, didn't we? Uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea came and wrapped the body in strips of linen and 75 pounds of uh, all kinds of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't get used to that thing. 75 pounds of, uh, help me, Kenny, herbs and all that kind of good stuff. Thank you. Yeah, all kinds of uh, aromatic uh, spices and things like that. Um, the initial stuff had been done, but the, the, what needed to be done for him had not been done and couldn't be done because the Sabbath fell and they couldn't work on Friday night. So they had to, which Friday night would have been Saturday in the Jewish calendar. The next day starts at day, uh, at, at, when night falls. That's the beginning of the day. So she's there to finish the job. She notices the tomb is empty. She knows he's gone, Right? And there's the wrappings there. Those are the things that all of them saw. But they have different responses to all of it. Mary is given over to great distress. Peter is left kind of in shock. He's kind of numb. And John is very cautious. He goes to the edge of the tomb, but he doesn't go in. Remember that? Let's look at them one at a time. Peter starts out in shock. Imagine what had been going through his mind all week along, I said, even if everybody else falls away, I won't fall away. And Jesus said, you'll deny me three times, and then he does. What did he feel like? The empty tomb leaves him with a sense of shame. That's why he goes back to the room. I still have a big problem. John... In other words, Peter only took one look, right? He only took one look. He went straight in there, took a look at it, and ran out. John goes to the edge of the tomb, and he looks in, but he does not go in. He's uh, of the high priestly family. If he goes into a tomb, he's going to be unclean. He has to be careful. We're very lucky that Peter is as impulsive as he is. Are there any little brothers and sisters in here? Anybody in here, a little brother or sister besides me? Yeah, yeah. We watch those older ones, don't we? Yeah. You know, I've gotten hurt by watching my older brother do things that he knew how to do that I didn't know how to do yet. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He watches Peter and he goes, <laughs> I'm getting there first, but I'm not going in. Peter runs right in, so he decides to go in and take a second look. He noticed the empty tomb. He noticed all the wrappings and all that, but when he looks in the second time, he sees something different. He sees that the wrappings look like an empty cocoon. 
And he also sees the head napkin, the head thing that had covered Jesus' head, his face, is folded. Our NIV does not do a good job of translating that. It's folded where it would have been. And that causes him to believe. Why? Because in the Jewish world, as many of you probably heard before, when the master of the table got up, if he was done, he just took his napkin and crumpled it up and laid it there. But if he folded it, he said, I'll be back. It means I was coming back to the table. And John sees this folded napkin and he says, he said he was coming back. He's back. And his caution turns to belief. And that's great, isn't it? But he goes back to the room as well. Now let's look at Mary. She sees the stone. She's fixated on the stone. She's fixated on where is Jesus. She sees all that stuff. But she sticks around. The second look she has is she looks in the tomb. She sees something neither of the two men saw. She sees the two angels, the witnesses of God. Remember, it only took two angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? We ain't talking about wimpy critters here. We're talking about some pretty impressive creations of God, co-creation with us. And they testify. They care about her. Why are you crying? I don't want you to cry anymore. You don't need to cry anymore. He's alive and well. But that doesn't do it for her. Because nothing is going to do it for her. You get it? Her heart is broken. She can't see past the empty tomb. She can't see past the wrappings. Even the two angels, even a word from angels, doesn't do it for her. She has to see Jesus face to face. Her third look brings her to a place of relief and joy. And instruction. Go back and tell your brothers that I'm alive and well. I like what Jesus says. This is a curious statement. Watch me now. I'm putting on my left turn signal. You follow me, okay? Watch. Look, see. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. What that implies is, don't hold on to me yet. Where then is she supposed to hold on to Jesus? When he's ascended to the Father. He says, cling to me in heaven, don't cling to me here. When I go to heaven, you stay with me. You stay connected to me, no matter what, no matter when. What you have seen is true. I'm alive and well. And I will always be with you. Cling to me, but wait and to hold on to me. Wait to grab me until you get to heaven. Then hold on with both hands. How many times have you been through a rough patch in your life and you wondered if you were going to make it? And somehow in that midst of that, you decided Jesus said he would never leave you or forsake you. You clung to that promise in Scripture. And suddenly you felt a little bit better. Sometimes you felt a whole lot better. Sometimes a peace came on where there had been raging chaos. Sometimes the waves just got a little smaller. But always there was a difference when you cling to Jesus? How many of you look at the good things in your life and you give thanks to God and you realize that the fruit of your life is because you are clinging, connected to the branch. We're just a branch connected to that olive vine, Jesus, the tree, the tree of life. Cling to me then, he says. What an odd thing. Here's probably the linchpin of the whole deal. They didn't know the scriptures. They knew what Jesus had said, but they had never really understood when he quoted prophets from the Old Testament about himself. They didn't pay attention to that. That had never sunk in. Do you get that? 
They had never sunk in. These were not men who were scholars. They were not women who knew their Bibles backwards and forwards. They were people who just went to the Sabbath and did what they thought they were supposed to do and lived their lives as best they could. They were not people of Scripture. That's not a condemnation. That's just a reality. They didn't know that he had to rise from the dead. Do you remember in Luke when Jesus talks to the two disciples that are on the road to Emmaus? They've given up and left. And he has to tell them, Oh, I'm sorry, earlier on he says, I'm, I told you that everything is written about the prophets, about the Son of Man, will be fulfilled. Fulfilled. They'll mock him, insult him, all this stuff. He had told them what was going to happen, but when he got to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, let me catch up now. When he got to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they're leaving, they're giving up, and he spends time with them. They don't know who he is at that point. And he says to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And watch this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He pointed out everywhere where there was an image that was really pointing, pointing to him. He pointed out everywhere where there, a prophet said something that would be only applicable to him. Isaiah 53, if you go read that one, it's probably the most clear one. He opens the scriptures to them. Look how it keeps coming back to the scriptures. What are we looking at? Are we looking for signs? Are we looking for wowie zowie things? Or have we got our eyes firmly fixed on scripture? How are we to cling to Jesus? If that's our job, we can't go back 2,000 years. There's no time machine for us to go back and see the empty tomb and all that kind of good stuff. We have to go back to Jesus. We still, if we're not careful, if we don't know our scriptures, how are we to cling to Jesus? This is a critical, critical point. And forgive me if I step on your toes and step on mine in the process. How much time do we spend in Scripture a week? How many people do you know that the only Scripture they hear all week long is whatever they hear in church? And how many people do you know who only go to church Easter and Christmas? And you wonder why... They don't cling to Jesus. They have nothing to cling to. See, this is our lifeline. Scripture is our lifeline to Jesus. This is one of the primary way he's going to talk to us. We'll talk a little bit more about how he's going to do that later, but this is the vehicle he uses. And so when we go to Scripture, it allows us to cling to Jesus. When we, how many times have you read a scripture and you got something out of it? You went that same scripture another time in your life and you got even more out of it. You went to that scripture another time and you got even more out of it. I bet you, anything you want to bet, you pick any passage in the Bible, you read it on Monday, you're going to get something out of it. You read it again on Tuesday, you're going to get more out of it. You read it on Wednesday, you're going to get more out of it. You read it on Thursday, you're going to get even more. The more you look and then look and then look again and then keep looking the deeper that word gets and the more personal it's going to get. The more Jesus will speak to you in your situation right now. See, the, the, the Bible is not a collection of stories and myths and legends. It's the living word of God. It's how God talks to us today. It's how he wants us to view the world because this is how he sees the world. He defines the problem in one way. The world defines all the problems in another way. He sees what the answer is and defines the answer. And and in the world, we'll choose anything but God's answer to figure it out. And why is it that we're so easily suckered? It's because we don't know the word of God. Because we don't spend enough time there. You know, an easy way to start, 
Get that Bible app on your phone. There's a verse of the day. And if you read that verse in the morning, and then go back to that at noon when you're at lunch, and then go back to it at supper. I know a lot of people have it. I know Teresa has it. Because it's on she puts it on Facebook every day. Yeah. What about scripture? And why aren't we in it? Can I bring this home a little bit more critically? The Methodist Church has an identity problem right now. Because part of the church doesn't believe that scripture is the word of God anymore. Or if they do, they read what they want to read and they throw out what they don't want to throw out and they interpret things the way they want to according to the way they see things and the way the world sees things. And they try to massage the word to make it sound like whatever the agenda is on the other side. In the book of Acts, after Pentecost, it said they devoted themselves to the reading of Scripture and the teaching of the apostles and to fellowship and the breaking of bread. That's what they devoted themselves to. Why did the church explode so big and become so vibrant? Because they lived according to the Scriptures. And they lived by what the apostles said. Well, you and I can't go back to the apostles anymore. They are long passed into heaven. But their words remain, especially Paul's. Half the New Testament was written by Paul in his letters. And we can still cling to the, the, the teachings of the apostles. But anytime we start walking away from the, those original eyewitnesses, anytime we start walking away and thinking we're smarter now because we have science and we have this and we have that, we have to start diminishing what God says. and We have to start diminishing God himself. And that's a very dangerous thing. We as a denomination are facing that issue right now. Are we a people, like John Wesley said, he was a man of one book. This is a man who had read every book that was ever written up to his time. Something like 10,000 books. He'd read them all. He said, I'm a man of one book. Which book was he talking about? The Bible. Everything, he, he knew his Bible backwards and forwards. He could quote it, by, he'd memorized it. He could, it was his primary language, not his second language. It was his primary language. And that's why the Methodist movement took off the way it did. And he said, my, my concern is that the United Methodist Church, or the Methodist Church, would not, I'm, not, I'm not concerned that it wouldn't exist in the future. I'm concerned that it would turn into a bunch of people who don't know the word anymore and make up things as they go along. Now, that's, that's my interpretation of what John Wesley said. But that's basically what he said. We have some decisions to make. We each have a decision to make. What is the authority for how you're going to view reality and live your life? If it's whatever you think, if it's whatever you think is best, if it's based on what other people say, you know, some of that can be really good and some of that can be really bad. But the scripture is not bad. The scripture is pure and holy. It's the directive word of God. How much are we in it? Oh, friends, let's look. And then let's look again. And then let's look again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stand for our closing song.
leave, don't forget there's an administrative council meeting right after church. That's right. All who'd like to stay, please stay and help us uh, guide this church along in the decisions we make. I have a blessing for you. Will you receive it? Oh, I pray that every time you open your Bible, it speaks to you personally. And that in that reception of what you need to hear, your soul comes alive to a new level. Your joy becomes more complete. Your hope for the future, in spite of what you see on TV, gets stronger and stronger and stronger as we watch and wait for the return of our King, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week.